You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. This is show number 79 for October of 2019. It's been over a month since the new Defender was revealed, and there's been a there's been a number of rumors and some unconfirmed reports about the Defender. So aside from mentioning them here at the top of the show... That's all we have planned for Defender Talk this month. Some of us need a break. Let's see some real-world Defenders out there first before we go back into more rumors and such. And the, the new Defender is not supposed to be delivered until the first quarter of next year, so there's still plenty of time for rumors. Our guests this month are a Canadian family who bought a Defender sight unseen and overlanded Europe. Jessica and Tyler of 54 Countries later, later in the podcast. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I'm fine with buying stuff sight unseen. I have a pretty good tolerance for that, but to, but to buy it sight unseen and then expect to fly in and just take off on a massive trip, I mean, that, that takes a, a certain amount of bravery. A- and then to do it with a newborn baby in tow, that's just, that's off the charts. <laughs> uh, does that, are, do we add them to our badass category? I, well, I don't know. It's, it's something. You'll find out later in the show. Uh, I'm, by the way, your host, uh, John Costage, and that was Harold joining me via Skype. How you doing, Harold? Uh, I'm here. That's good. And Dixon, how are you, sir? Not too bad. It's good. Enjoying Dixon. the rain up here in Canada. Indeed, you were. Uh, I had a friend who was near you in Ottawa this past weekend, but he's not. Uh, a, he's not a Land Rover guy, though. Thanks for your comments, likes, follows, Twitter, Instagram, email. I think I cover them all. Facebook, too. Thank you for your support through Patreon donations and our merchandise sales. You can show your support for the show by buying a T-shirt or sticker. You can also become a monthly supporter through Patreon. All the details are on our website. And we also have a new way for you to show your love for the show. You can buy me a tea. There's a link on our website. Uh, You can buy any of us a drink of any sort. It's called Buy Me a Tea, though, is what I'm calling it. And if you put one of our names in the optional message field, I'll make sure you... uh, that person gets that otherwise uh, we'll distribute it evenly amongst us is that accessible through a website or is there an app for that or, or how does that work it's a website uh, and it is linked to from our website so you show up on our website and and you'll find the link correct at the very top of the okay. page and the menu is buy me a tea rover kids we are planning to run that in the december show as part of our december show so if your kid would like to be on the podcast you can email me at messages at centersteer.com that's in the british spelling c-e-n-t-r-e with the subject line rover kids we'll schedule a call or a skype call and you can even record the talk with your kid and send it to us if you if that would be easier for you uh, we're going to collect all your stories for another month so towards the end of uh, November or so, maybe early December, and then we'll, again, they'll be highlighted in the December show. And some events. So I attended MAR, which was uh, the Rover Owners of Virginia down in Pembroke, Virginia. Had a great time. Aside from being windy, the weather was really nice. It was uh, cool. And uh, in the evenings, sat around the fire, had a couple beers. I got to talk to Bill Burke. You know, I rode with Bill Burke, and we did some trail clearing. Had a lot of fun. It was a, it was a really really good time. Also got to talk prob- to you. probably a real experience to ride with Bill Burke. <laughs> it was actually yeah. We had, it was nice. We didn't do as much off roading uh, on the trail as we anticipated, but uh, we did have a we had a nice time. Got to got to watch Bill and take trails and do his thing. And I get the feeling that that Bill sort of makes it all seem kind of no big deal. Effortless. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There you go. There's a the word. Yes, absolutely. You are correct, sir. It is, in fact, effortless. Uh, he, I did learn the difference uh, between 
the different kinds of bear droppings because well, we that's did, useful info. Uh, absolutely, very much it was, and I don't. I wish I'd remembered the joke. There's a I, if I if I remember this correctly, and I apologize if I get it wrong ahead of time because uh, we saw pellets. They were black pellets that were on the ground, and and they were in a pile. And Bill said, "Oh, that's that's a that's a." black bear and he says do you know the difference between a black uh, black bear droppings and grizzly droppings he said black bear droppings uh, look like blackberries grizzly droppings look like bells and something else some uh, and granola and granola i think Gr- gro- yeah, i say i already screwed up the joke bells and granola as in the grizzlies will like actually attack you and attack people that think that they're nice bears so Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't tell the joke. Well, we should have to get uh, we'll get Bill back on. He can and I'll have him tell that tell that joke better, but uh, there is a difference apparently between those. And, and just to clarify, this did happen in the woods, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there was uh, Well, the... there's often a question as to whether the bear does this in the woods. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this was definitely in the woods. Yeah, definitely. We were helping to clear uh, trail number 3. They were finishing up the clearing of the trail and uh, I assisted Bill with uh, marking out some of the trail and uh, it was which was pretty cool to figure out which way you want to turn and twist and is this going to be a good angle for for folks. It was kind of it was neat to need to assist and help out bill you learn you learn you learn anything about trail maintenance from him uh, I, uh, well i don't know if i necessarily learned anything uh i mean i think it's things that most folks know you know just uh you gotta you know watch your line watch angles probably maybe maybe uh what's the, what's the angle when the vehicle's on the side you know you gotta what's your break and i know break over angle you know forward to, to forward to back but if like on the side what, what is that what's that's called something is that camber i think it's camber yeah you, Okay. Tipping angle. Tipping angle, like, but on the side, not not forward to back, yeah. but uh, you know, side to side. And there was a, you know, we we actually mapped out. He mapped out a route, and uh, and with you know, he thought that was people were going to take it. It was like a ninety degree bend, but then uh, when they actually ran it, they took a sli- they took a little bypass and did it a slightly different angle to get a run for the uh, for this hill that you were going to take on the on the bend. I thought that the line was uh, getting up to that point where they ran, went around this uh, rock and made the 90-degree bend. I thought that point wasn't too bad as far as uh, side-to-side camber. But Bill's like, yeah, this is a little, you know, this is a little more than people will probably like or anticipate or, or care for. And, of course, it was dry, and it was still kind of grassy. So you can imagine uh, after a couple rides and then if it were to get wet, uh, it would probably be even more challenging when you're especially on the side and I don't think folks are used to that side to side uh, inclination how was attendance at the uh, the mark? It was very good. Yeah. I took a lot of pictures on my. I put some of them on the center steer page, uh, on the uh, Facebook page, and also some of my personal area. Attendance was great. There was a good number of people. Lucky Eight was there. Sarek was there. Auto Work uh, was there. Rovers North. You know, Jeff Aronson was there in attendance, and uh, Bill, of course, Bill Burke, Four by Four America was there, and he uh, did a slideshow on the Camel Trophy that he participated in. And that was really nice to see. I hadn't seen that one before. We did talk about talk about that on the podcast when we interviewed him, but he, uh, he actually did show slides. Trails were fun. Our local friend uh, Bob uh, went out on the trail, and uh, of course he did as he usually does with his disco. He, you know, broke something, broke a window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bob is one of those guys that likes to, you know, beat the obstacle out of the way with his truck. <laughs> he didn't, yeah, and uh, he uh, he wasn't actually unhappy. He usually does hit or break something. It's usually nothing. You know, vehicle ending something. Will, you know, something will break. Is you know maybe oh, yeah, he, he's always able to drive it home. Well, he puts it on a trailer, which is even better. So that's I think that okay. helps. That helps going on the trail and not worrying too much about about hurting something. But this, uh, he broke the driver's side rear Discovery 2 window, and he wasn't too upset because he's been wanting to replace those windows with, uh, with panels. So he's like, yeah, now I can put those in. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't so remember which side. You know, Dave had the same failure. He broke all the stuff, and then he pitched all of his stuff out through the hole onto the trail. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that was a driver's side, too, wasn't it? I believe. I, I think can't that's remember. What, that's what Dave did, yeah. And I also got to talk to a couple listeners when I was down there. It was nice to, to meet listeners, sold a couple of T-shirts. Uh, Jeff Aronson, as I said, was there, and he had just bought his Series 2, 2A, 109. And he's going to tell us all about that in December. He'll be back on the show then. That should be a fun time. And I participated in two of the competitions uh, at MAR, and which was really cool. The 
the first one was the blind driver competition, and I actually won. So that was pretty cool. And there was a, I think there are about 10 different contestants and you blindfold yourself. They have a safety person in the vehicle who holds a radio and they make sure you don't hurt anybody or anything. Or cheat. Or cheat. And then you have a spotter. And my spotter was uh, my friend Bob. He called out uh, which way to go over the radio. And then you have four, you have three cones, set of cones in a kind of a diamond pattern that you have to get through. And then you need to park in the in the garage which are four cones set up and you back in i did that actually we did that uh, myself and bob because without i just i was really just a driver without bob telling you where to go uh would not have well and really the won. impressive thing about that is not that you're doing this blind and getting instructions but <laughs> but your spotter is speaking scottish and you still managed to win i i had i had a translator uh, myself i was able to translate yes uh, yeah scottish that's bob. and that's but doing that while driving and being blind is quite an accomplishment because i mean i like bob but wow he sometimes <laughs> you really got to listen carefully bob was so good that he then was the spotter for the next two participants after me. Bob is that good at spotting. So really, Bob should Bob should have won something. And I already brought this up with uh, the with Rove. Uh, they gave away a prize to the driver. Prize should go to the spotter too because they do a lot of the work. But I already brought that up to uh, to Rove. And then there was a uh, another off road, not off road, a uh, technical competition. And there were the Jeff Aronson ran this one. This was the Rovers North. Jeff Aronson technical one and there were two halves to it uh, heat one and heat two if you will the first one you had uh, gates and they were and you had to go through the gates and it was down a slope and then come back up and that was a non-timed event well i guess it was timed but they had a you had to meet to the time that they did it so there, there was an expected time and if you hit a gate or reversed you got points time added on so you were expected to meet the Whatever that time was, I did well in that one. Didn't I? Didn't win this one, nor did I win the second heat. Uh, but I, I, I did pretty well in this. You, know, you drove through. And I backed up. I think once. I think I. I don't think I hit any gates on that one. And then you stop, and then you wait, and then you do the timed one. And this one is so. The next heat is the same thing. There's a. Uh, it's on a slope. There are gates you have to go through. Very much like you know skiing slalom. You know, you, 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 I'm sure you've all seen that. Is, is this the thing they call the RTV? Yes. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. RTV. Yes, this is the RTV. And this one was timed. So the faster you went, then you would, you know, you would win. If you hit a gate, then I think they added on 30 seconds. And if you reversed, uh, I believe it was five seconds they added on to your time. That one did poorly on. <laughs> I think I reversed like three times and I think I ended up hitting hitting a gate, uh, like two or three gates. And mainly the reason, and you, you find this out pretty quickly, the gates are closer together, whereas they were fairly wide on the pre on the heat one heat two was more narrow and the first three on the first as opposed to raising the bar they just narrow the gate i'm glad we watched probably half dozen people go before me you know we're waiting in line a lot of people are participating which was nice uh, but you got to watch in the first three gates the the gate one and gate two the passenger side or in my case the driver side that where the gate was it was, and it was a um, steel rod in the ground with a plastic tube you know on top of it that was your that was your gate fairly substantial driven in good foot into the ground but that gate on that side on the left on the right hand side driver side for me there was a hole right there so Jeff knew where to put it in the right place there was a hole so you're so as you would go through that gate your vehicle would lurch to the right hand side and if you didn't know that or weren't anticipating it you were going to hit the gate and they were going to add time you on. in it did as soon as you start off you're realizing these gates are narrower and oh don't forget there's a hole there, there's a pothole at the gate not like before or after this is like at the gate so you know your vehicle is going to go in it but you're trying to avoid a, it so you don't go in it black hole <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was, I mean, it was fun. It was challenging, and it was fun. I I, I don't have, know who the winners were, but I, I did win the uh, the blind driver challenge. I did win that, so that was exciting. That that, that one's impressive. I gotta say. Yeah, yeah. And as I said then, and I want to make sure to say it publicly one more time, thanks to Bob, because without Bob, I wouldn't have won at all. Good show. And Harold, you were at the Overland Expo, right? 
I was, and it was sort of a last-minute unplanned thing. I, I hadn't really the intention of going, but sort of at the last minute realized that I, I kind of needed to go. Doing some research for, for a, 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 well, resto mod, you might call it. A, a client of mine wants to repower. And we have decided to pull the trigger big time, and we're going to put a Cummins R2.8 in his truck. Nice. And so uh, one of the vendors that does this sort of stuff was down there, and uh, one of our friends of, in the community, uh, Doug Crowther from Dividing Creek, has done several of these now, and he had one there that he had just sort of pieced together in a hurry just to show proof of concept, and, and it was there. Another one of his trucks was there. In fact, the other truck that was there was uh, belonged to uh, someone who listened on our show and decided after hearing about Rovicon to go. And so he, he went to Rovicon because he heard about it on our show. I talked to him at uh, Mar also. Right. And so he has a 90 with the Cummins in it. So we looked at that for a good bit. And, and uh, so I got a lot of information, um, saw some neat stuff. The coolest thing at the show, by a long shot, walking along and, and saw this this what looked like an international scout, but it, something about it wasn't quite right. It sort of was a scout and sort of not. So I went up and looked and looked under the hood, and lo and behold, there's a five liter V8 Cummins diesel in it. That's interesting. That's got mm -hmm. my attention. And I'm looking around and I'm realizing, okay, there's a lot of stuff printed in Japanese. Ah, I know what they did. They reskinned a Nissan Titan. Ooh. They took a, a Nissan Titan pickup. Uh, they, 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 well, they Cummins makes that five liter V8 just for Nissan. Although I have a sneaking suspicion that that's going to be another in their crate engine series because they say the R2.8 is only their first crate engine. These guys, and you look inside the truck, and it's all bone stock. It still has the Nissan steering wheel and everything. But I talked to these guys, and they took this stock Nissan Titan. They sawed it right down the middle and shortened it, the wheelbase by 46 inches then they peeled all the skin off the outside and built a scout body by hand to fit it Impressive. phenomenal phenomenal work too i mean it looks really good and uh, you know it looks like a scout i mean the proportions are just a hair off so i mean if you really know scouts you know it's not a scout but but i mean from a distance it it, it brings you in and it looks at it and, and the workmanship is is really incredible so i just had to stand there for a bit and and just listen as all the people walking by hey check it out they put a cummins in that old scout like well no actually they kind of put a scout on that cummins <laughs> But yeah, that was that was the coolest thing at the show by by a long shot, and it's surprisingly not all that many Land Rovers there. There were some, but it was, you know, it was, of course it was Jeeps and Toyotas and parts for Jeeps and Toyotas. And, but I mean, easily seventy-five to eighty percent of the event was was tents and off-road trailers, rooftop tents and off-road trailers. You mean off-road trailers or trailers yeah. to carry cars and vehicles on? No, no, no. Yeah, off-road camping trailers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be an up and coming uh, a thing. Yeah, uh, rooftop, it is a thing. Rooftop tr uh, tents used to seem to be have been a thing a couple of years ago, and now I seem a lot more on the trailer side. We're getting older and can't crawl up on the <laughs> roof of a vehicle anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just it kind of depends on on what you want to do and and how you want to do it. And there are people that still like the rooftop because then you're all based on one vehicle. But then there are a lot of people that want to be able to tow a trailer because that way they're not limited to one vehicle. They can tow it with whatever they have at the moment or or leave it and go for a trail ride. I mean, the downside to having the rooftop tent, if you're going to be in a certain area for several days, you know, like a big national park, if you want to go exploring, you've got to knock the tent down every time you want to go somewhere. Kind of a downside. I was talking to some folks. They're not Land Rover people, but the, just some friends, and they were thinking, oh, we'd like to get a, an RV and go off and travel and do things. Or how are you going to drive once you get there? He's, you know, you have this 14, 24, or however long you know, RV you get, and they're like, oh, we well, hadn't thought about that part. <laughs> well, if you go go really big, they have some with a garage underneath, and you can tuck right. a little vehicle in there. Right, or you can uh, go the Bill Burke route, have the RV tow a trailer, which has your vehicle in it. Do you recall, was there a 
trying, I was trying to look for the name of this trailer, Harold, but it, it was a, there was actually two I've seen recently that, that interested me. One was a French trailer, really small. Uh, be, I think it was like Carvetti or Caravette, uh, something like that. I was curious. Sorry, was, I, I really don't know the brand name. That's that fine. Stuff. Okay. And then there was a, another that folded, that folds up or folds in, excuse me. And it, it's like an eight person, almost like a party trailer, <laughs> but this, <laughs> the, but it collapses in and then it, instead of the ones that we have that fold down and are flat, this one folds in the sides and then it's almost like a billboard going down the road where it's uh, this uh, pylon in the middle. And uh, it's almost like a sail. Oh, that's got to be fun in a crosswind. That's what I see. That's what I wanted. Yeah, that's the interesting. It looks I, if you're going short distances or you're not too worried about high winds, I think that would be pretty cool. But it, th- yeah, this one it's light, it's aluminum, and you know it is in a more effective sail. Oh, I know. It's, that was exactly what I was thinking. I, I should should have uh, should have looked it up beforehand. But yeah, trailers are uh, certainly interesting. I will add, uh, uh, while we're still sort of on the topic of the Overland Expo, I did run into some of the friends of our show. I have Dan Greck, uh, the road chose me. He was on our show quite a while ago. You have to go back and look through the, the, the episodes. But he's our only non-rover person uh, that we've had as a guest. He overlands in a Jeep. But we, we, we let him get away with that because he's pretty cool and he's doing the same kinds of things. And, but it was it was neat to meet him and, and see his truck and get the walk around and, and nice guy. And I also ran into the foremans, Strangers Like Angels, who were on our show quite a while ago. Explore um, more. Explore more is their, their site and they're trying to raise money to restore the truck that they drove back in the 70s. They were all there. Uh, I did not actually meet Sergeant Badass because he was off doing something, I think getting some food or something when I was there. But I did talk to, to Jan and Charles quite a bit. Excellent. So it was nice to see some of our guests in person. Sounds like we need to get back on the show. I think we do. Sounds like a good event. Yeah, it was good. It's a, it's a new venue in, in Virginia. It's it's like a Arrington? big open. Yeah, yeah. It's a, like a farm that's been converted into like a venue and they use it for music festivals and other things hmm. they they seemed like they were still kind of trying to figure it out as far as the the, the layout and, and the getting the people organized in the morning i was there on the first day and i was there when it opened so i mean they probably just weren't fully up to speed but then i heard heard some people complaining about you know they're just not being all that organized in the food court and that sort of thing but i think you know it's a new venue and they're still trying to figure it all out I think that they'll probably get it get it sorted. Yeah, they used to be able to build more, and right. you know, that's when I was there, right? And they moved right. to so that so this is in, Southern in Virginia. Virginia. Well, the Biltmore is in, in North Carolina, isn't it? Uh, no, no uh, it is. I was saying the new site though is in Southern it's, Virginia. Yeah, well, it depends on how you define it. Some people call that area Central Virginia, but it's it's actually not that far from from the various Mar sites down there. It was just oh, okay. just south of, of Charlottesville. I stayed overnight in Charlottesville and and drove it in the morning in about a half an hour. More accessible for us then. Yeah, well, for us, yeah, it's a little bit closer. Also, it sounds like closer to D.C. where there's a high concentration of Land Rover and off-roading people. It seems like there's just a lot in Virginia everywhere, but definitely a high concentration in D.C. because there's just lots of people in D.C. I found that French trailer that I I saw. It's it's the Carapate. I think I'm saying that right. C-A-R-A-P-A-T-E. It's just a nice looking little trailer. It's basically just a room. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Okay. I can't. I couldn't find the other one while we were talking. Like I said, I was just there to do do a, a limited amount of product research and just kind of looked around because I was there. But I was just not, my business was was to to look at engines and transmissions and that sort of thing. Coming up, beginning of November, November eighth through the tenth is Rovers on the Rocks X one. I think it's the 10th, but I think they're starting a new naming convention. So oh, maybe this, maybe the 10th was last year. So this must be the 11th. And so this is, well, yeah, looks like they're using Roman well, we numerals. Didn't, we didn't make it last year. so <laughs> We tried. We did try. Yeah, was, Rovers on the iceberg. They should have called that one. <laughs> oh, that was, uh, yeah. As, as I've that said, was I've, something else. As I've, yeah. And, you know, I was up through that way again, Harold, last weekend for other purposes. And I remembered that <laughs> where we were stuck for a while. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. But I don't, I don't mind. It wouldn't have been quite so bad if it wasn't for all that traffic of people going to the, Penn, to the State. Penn State game. Yeah. Upon reflection, Harold, I think that saved us. 
Well, in some ways it did, but in some ways I'm just thinking all these people that really have no clue skidding around up there, that could have been really bad. To re- remind folks and refresh your memory, or maybe you didn't listen to the show then, uh, we were traveling up through State College, near State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State is, and there was a Penn State game, and we were headed to Rovers and the Rocks in eastern Pennsylvania, which is in, uh, I guess, Cole Township, I think is the, the location. And Harold and I were in the 110 driving, and, it, and you could see on the other side of the road, and it's a dual carriageway, two-lane road that's split so you've got two lanes uh, and there's a wide median in between and all of a sudden you start <laughs> there's not many cars on the opposite side traveling westbound we were traveling eastbound good bit of traffic and we're starting to slow down and then you see the people on the other side start sliding and they're flying but they start sliding and in tractor trailer trucks and we're coming thankfully coming to a stop because of all the traffic that's going to the going to the Penn State game but also people are stopping because it's now an ice covered road and we realize that and I think that's what saved us Harold was all, all those vehicles started to, since it was icy and they came to a stop I think we would have uh, we might have had a problem well we were already slowed down for all the heavy traffic yeah and in that sense it probably did make things more sane yeah yeah, it's 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 something special to look over and see a PennDOT truck full of salt sliding around. <laughs> sliding around. But don't let that stop you if you're in the area of going to Rovers on the Rocks 11, which is coming up uh, November 8th through the through the 10th. Bob, speaking of Bob, by the way, he won last year. He won their technical competition, and uh, he's hoping to return to uh, defend his title this year. Well, he, yeah, he, he and our good friend, uh, the late Dave Carroll, used to go up there all the time, and, and they both really enjoyed that show. Well, there's not much news, and so apparently we've talked a lot to get to the point where there isn't much news, so we'll see how this goes. So let's get into the we, we news. We used it all up. <laughs> we used up all the time. We're like, oh, there's not much news, so this will be, be relatively short. No, we decided you to. You have reached the end of the Internet. Please turn back. <laughs> So good news for JLR. They released their latest results. The company turned to profitability in the second quarter for the of the financial year, which ended in September. A busy three-month period saw an 8% rise in revenue and the company profits of 156 million pounds. The turnaround in fortunes comes despite a slight decline in overall sales, with soaring sales in China coming as welcome shot in the arm for the manufacturer. And the results uh, have been in part attributed to demand for the Evoke and the Range Rover Sport models. Perhaps the best news for the period was a sharp improvement in the company's performance in China. Sales rose 24.3%. Wow. Oh, and overall worldwide, sales were down, but point point seven percent so sales were down worldwide 0.7 percent they were up in china 24.3 percent from a strategic standpoint i'd be concerned because you're now your return to profitability is all based around a 24 percent rise in sales in china which shows probably too much a dependency on that one market well, and we've seen that in the past, too, when China all yep. of a sudden has a, has a bad month. Everybody has a bad month. Uh, I'm curious to know what country is such a big loser that it, it canceled out that 24% gain. I did not see that, Harold. That was not information that uh, was in this article, at least, that I saw. It would also be interesting to know where they were with their economy drive and how that's playing into this, too. Uh, here we go. With cost savings of £2.2 billion today, JLR says it remains on track to achieve target savings of 2.5 billion pounds by the end of March 2020. So it looks like they are very clear on track. Excellent. I, yeah, I didn't see a breakdown of the sales, Harold. Didn't see that. Although it did, does say global retail sales for the Evoke were up 54% and global Range Rover Sport sales rose 17.5%. Uh, the all-electric I-Pace, Jag I-Pace, was a hit with retail sales up 2,500 vehicles. I like how they don't give a percentage on that one. They just say the total number of vehicles. Uh, next, JLR not for sale, says Tata. The chairman of Tata's motor holding company, Tata Sons Limited, told Bloomberg that JLR isn't for sale, pushing back on reports that they were planning on selling uh, JLR. He said the company is open to partnerships, but only if JLR has a say, as automotive production is a core business for Tata. So that's, I think, a good thing. Yep. Very good. Yeah. And I like the way they phrase that, too. If JLR wants to or is involved which is an interesting article considering some of the recent speculative ones based around the bmw and land rover partnerships that are being forged and whether or not this means anything i think that's reinforcing what they've done with with uh, bmw you know you kind of got to be careful how you publicize partnerships with german companies just ask chrysler 
<laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's funny. After we talked about that the last time, I thought about that more. And you hear about Mercedes, and then you think, they they bought Chrysler, and then they got rid of it pretty quickly. How does the... <laughs> It just that one boggles well, the mind. Yeah, I mean the thing, but the thing is, they 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 build it as a merger of equals, and that was really just to get Chrysler to sign off on it, and then they later realized, yeah, it really was just a takeover. They Even, got what they wanted, and then they but, they actually paid the corporate scrap man to haul off Chrysler. But what what did they want? What what did they want out of out of Chrysler that that Mercedes couldn't get on its own or from other perp, other means? I really don't know. I used to know. I don't okay. remember now. There were some things they they did gain. But okay, all right. Can't remember now off the top of my head. The uh, but the yeah the merger acquisition thing. I think that was that was obvious, and I think that was just placating the the Chrysler people. But the, the I just I still focus on the fact that they had it for like two years, and they're like, no, we're done. Just go, just go away. That was yeah, I, it was I found a little it longer fascinating. than that, but yeah, it 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 went away kind of quietly in a way. Next, the Gaiden Triangle inside JLR's Tech High, uh, HQ. This is the first time that uh, Jaguar or Land Rover has had a production center that's a headquarters and i'll read some of the details here last month jlr's world changed entirely when ralph spaith opened a new product creation center home for thirteen thousand engineers near gaden about 10 miles southeast of warwick in the five years of planning and three of construction the complex has come to be known as the gaden triangle in recognition of the shape described by the original airfield's three intersecting runways its opening combined with the relocation of the triangle to the 280 strong of, excuse me, of the 280-strong Jaguar design team, JLR's advanced engineering group, and the vital but little celebrated procurement team means that for the first time, JLR has an authentic nerve center, a technical hub where its cars will be conceived, designed, engineered, and developed, and rolled on experimental wheels for the first time en route to approval for full-scale production. At the center's opening, Spaith told Autocar that the base would orchestrate all global engineering sites of Jaguar and Land Rover across the world world from China, Hungary, India, Ireland, Slovakia to the USA. For the first time, we can co-locate the essential divisions of the comprehensive product creation process with critical manpower here in Gaiden. And that's an end quote. In addition to being created here, all future Jaguar and Land Rover products will be tested on Gaiden's collection of high-speed, suburban, cratered, and muddy test tracks, as well as its emission labs and it, and at temperatures down to negative 40 degrees Celsius in its cold chambers. The interesting thing is you don't even you don't actually have to clarify Celsius when you're talking about negative 40. Oh, that, that's it, true. It's the, sa- it's the same in Fahrenheit, right? Uh, Exactly. That is the one temperature where they are the same, and you can drop the letter because it doesn't matter. With talk centering so firmly on future transport, a visit to Jaguar's design Jaguar's design complex seems a must, especially since newly appointed Jaguar design director Julian Thompson made it clear that this visit was a one-off. Visitors are never routinely invited to, into these portals, he said, and even most people at JLR denied access. Once you've left, it's over, said Thompson, assuring us that although Land Rover Studios are now located right next door, the two facilities will function independently of one another. The high-speed circuit is almost like a mini Le Mans running 3.3 miles of four-lane tarmac that features a mile-long straight. There are a supporting 7.5 miles of handling tracks dubbed low speed. Throw in several miles of cross-country tracks, brake test areas, sand pits, mud holes, suspension test facilities with deliberately crafted concrete potholes, and most evil of all, a high-speed curb strike and pothole brake test area, and you're talking about an exceptionally comprehensive proving ground. Sounds like a fun place to play for the day. Yeah. Is uh, the question I. It's actually an old uh, Cold War V bomber base. You can actually see the place because that's where the Gaydon uh, British Heritage Motor Trust Museum is located. Is that the same grounds? The same grounds. Ah. It's just off to one side. And it was also used by British Leyland um, as a development test place after the uh, RAF got rid of it. You can go see the thing. And uh, though, as you say, you can't go in and see it. You can see it from the outside. Well, actually, I don't think you can. They've built some berms, I think, to keep the spy cameras out, like a high high road berms, if I remember uh, correctly. There's always Google Earth. Yeah, but that doesn't give you real-time data. That's when you launch your drone. I was going to say, take a drone and, and make it happen. Did they mention in this article, because I didn't see it, does this replace Land Rover's off-road facility at Solihull? The off-road facility at Solihull is also leveraged quite heavily with the, the Heritage Tour and everything else, so... This will certainly su- uh, supplement it. 
Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they do a lot of R and D at Solo Hull with with that sort of. Not anymore. No, I think I think that that's really more for the for the tourists and probably special occasions and PR type things. Yeah, right. Like like uh, former employees that are reuni- reunited with their trucks after fifty or sixty years. Yeah. So along the lines of the Gaiden Center, uh, Spath also said that the JLR now considers itself an IT company. At the opening of the new design center, Spath branded the company an IT company as it looks to embrace more modern methods of production. And he said, actually kind of scary in a way if you think about it. He says, yeah, he says, we're now an IT company. We have to go away from the old ways of doing things, unquote, uh, says Spath. While the new facility was in the planning stages, the company borrowed ideas from Chinese tech giants Baidu and Alibaba, among others, according to Spath. Of the current JLR product range, the all electric Jag I Pace is the most technologically advanced that it offers. It has three electric modules, all of which can receive updates wirelessly and there are th- hundreds of millions of lines of code that keep the car running then can be that can be updated wirelessly over the air meanwhile the upcoming defender will have staggering 14 14- oh i apologize there is defender news i'm sorry i didn't i forgot about this but this is the end of it uh warning warning <laughs> defender content follows the the defender will have a staggering 14 modules again all of which will be updatable by wireless and unlike computer un- and unlike computers thanks to dual banking technology the updating process doesn't ha- hamper for the car's usability. Well, we hope. It's good for them to at least, even if they are not truly an IT company, it's important to acknowledge IT is critical to your to your business. Well, and I think that once you recognize that function, it also uh, opens the door and allows you to focus on doing that correctly and securely. Mm, correct. Which is, thank you, Harold, that uh, leads in our next article, uh, Cybersecurity. As important as brakes for future cars, says Spath. Especially when the braking system is controlled by by a computer. Yes. As there are 84 computers in that new Defender. And all cars are now highly computer controlled. It's it's important. And as an information security professional, fantastic to hear that they are putting... Uh, cybersecurity where it needs to be. In his speech, Spath outlined uh, JLR's Destination Zero target, which looks to ensure the company vehicles will have zero emissions, result in zero accidents, and cause zero congestion. And then cybersecurity, as I said, is one of the company's biggest challenges. The opportunity is there for cybersecurity to enhance the customer experience, protecting privacy, and creating safer, more secure mobility. And in the connected world, the cybersecurity, uh, the cybersecurity is a fundamental as your for, to your safety as the brakes. As long as they have a, a standard-based approach using NIST or one of the other international standards to go and do their cybersecurity, and they allow external auditors in to actually go and verify that they've done it, cybersecurity a lot of the time is a tremendous amount of hype. Oh, absolutely, it is. But at least they've mentioned it and they've used the word. There's a lot of companies that never mention it and never uh, give it lip service and say, "Oh, well, we're we're concerned about your privacy. We're concerned about your." Uh, uh, security and then they just kind of give it lip service w- remains to be seen of course if land rover does that or not but at least it, at least they have acknowledged that it's a critical not only is it critical uh, maybe we should make that clear not only is it critical to the company but cybersecurity is also critical to the company yeah well at least they're using qnix which is a unix variant and so on in the cars which is the first thing that's a good idea they're not using windows so we don't have to worry about the car rebooting after the uh <laughs> the daily patch comes down while well, i'm going down 81 or something at 75 also that was good to see that they have a uh, it looks sounds like they have a special update system that will accept the update and then, and then probably apply it when the vehicle's off or at some later point in time, which is, I mean, you laugh, but it's actually smart. It's a good thing instead right. of just... It's prudent. It's prudent, Very yeah, prudent. instead of just doing a live update. Yeah. And hopefully they've got some sort of mechanism or, or, or program that, that verifies the update worked correctly before it turns you loose with it. Well, for all our Land Rover IT people, I hope you enjoyed that. That was our IT corner for the month. Please, let's not make that a, speci- no. a monthly segment. No, no, no. Try not to. Not Try not to. I know there's a lot of Land Rover people, especially in North, in North America, are IT related. Some of us are, are recovering IT yes. professionals, so we try to limit our <laughs> exposure. Uh, JLR renews uh, partnership with DHL Supply Chain following a 10-year partnership with in which DHL Supply Chain has become a critical partner of JLR. Supply Chain and UK manufacturing operations, the contract is being renewed with new ambitions and an extended brief to manage the inbound supply chain for the company's new manufacturing site in Slovakia. So long as this enables us getting our parts quickly and efficiently, 
this is good news. Uh, Land Rover is developing a Range Rover that will focus on an entirely different type of range. And I admit, uh, and this is, a, this is about the electric Range Rover coming up. And I've already asked you guys to let me read to the end because there's a fun part at the end. I, I find this. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but a uh, good part of it. So uh, JLR referred to, is referred to the electric vehicle internally as the medium SUV, despite it sharing a platform with the upcoming full-sized XJ, Jaguar XJ. This places it around the Range Rover Velar in size. The Autocar reports it will be even more sleek and aerodynamic than the already rakish Velar. The upcoming Range Rover has been referred to internally as the Road Rover, and JLR has registered that nameplate. The EV will sit within the Range Rover family alongside the Range Rover Evoque, Velar Sport, and the OG Range Rover. I think we've come up with uh, what we're supposed to call the full-size Range Rover. We can call it the OG. They say that here. The Road Rover is expected to feature an electric motor on each axle, allowing power to be delivered to all four wheels as expected from a Range Rover product. The electric MLA platform can house batteries up to 90 0.2 kilowatt hours and it is capable of an electric range of 466 kilometers what's um, the recharge time uh does not say here you can read more about the article but here's my favorite part if that's the case don't expect to see the road rover nameplate technically range rover is a sub-brand of land rover and therefore it's unlikely the company will launch a car called the land rover range rover road rover <laughs> <laughs> thank you for letting me read that and then what you have to add uh the horsepower, what was it, the 90 kilowatts? So do they, was that, they put an E in front of that? Would it be like the E90 or something? Or do you multiply it by four since that's at each wheel? Well, and then, of course, you know, there's the the, the SV autobiographies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's <too>. true. <laughs> and then the trim level, your HHSE. You know, pretty much the, the entire first page of the brochure is just the name of the product. <laughs> in 12-point font. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Evoque. Speaking of names, everything you need to know. You can go out and check this for yourself. There's a brief summary of it. Uh, they launched the second generation of the Evoque. The redesigned compact SUV rides on a longer wheelbase and gets more dynamic looking face as well as a new mild hybrid engine and a lot of updates to the tech and safety features. One feature that stands out literally is the available clear sight ground view system which displays what is in front of and under the Evoque making negotiating off-road obstacles and dangers easier when you don't have someone to spot for you. This system makes it makes its debut on the Evoke. Only one observation. How do they keep the cameras clean under the vehicle when you are negotiating off-road obstacles, which might include mud? I have a better I have a better question. Who's taking an Evoke off-road? You would, if you had one. If I had one, I probably would because I'd just to try it out. But I think the average person's not doing it. But well but I, you, you, you know, it's it's the Freelander for the new millennium, too. So, you know, you took a Freelander off-road. I'm sure you'd take an Evoke if you had it. Indeed. Oh, of, of course I would. Uh, but you raise a good point, Dixon. How, how are they keeping those cameras clean? That's a that's an excellent point. I wonder if they put some coat film coating on it, or is it is it angled in such a way maybe that water would also get on them? I don't know. Well, it is a Range Rover we're talking about. They probably have little spray nozzles, like for the headlamps. And I wonder if they're heated, too, to keep the ice from building up on them. Of course. you got to do it. And then the Land Rover Discovery Sport D180 all-wheel drive SE 2019 UK review. Not long ago, this version of the latest Dis Disco Sport would have been decisively the biggest seller of the range. We all know why it will sell more slowly these days, but the fact remains that a fat 317 pound-feet slug of torque severely is just what an off-roader, a, a family seven seater and a tow car need to best to deliver mm -hmm. on its mission served early as in a great way to start your day the disco sport is all of these things of course besides being a civilized long distance machine that when equipped with its 178 brake horsepower two liter turbo diesel engine is capable of fuel economy that shouldn't alarm and this despite the fact that it weighs 1953 kilograms a fair old hunk of heft of a for a vehicle that is a direct descendant of the freelander now, the disco sport has undergone the unusual automotive equivalent of having a heart, lung, and liver transplant. It now rides on an entirely new platform. You can probably list the cars that have undergone a mid-life platform transplant on the stock of one of the steering column, but the Disco Sport has undergone one in order that shares the innards of the latest Evoke, allowing the aforementioned 48-volt hybridization to be offered. 
Your isolation from the commotion of motion is pleasingly complete, if not to the point that you feel divorced from what's going on. The Ingenium engine is still identifiable as such when moving off, but on the move, it's as subdued as a dozing dog. There are occasions when the transmission can appear similarly dozy, but it's more alert than when it was on the D240 Disco Sport recently tested. Suddenly demanding the car to get up and go sometimes prompts a momentarily freeze before a gear is abruptly delivered. But when you're properly on the move, the gearbox oozes smoothly between its upper ratios. This is not a car you can steer through with the throttle, though, and feel through the steering wheel rim does little to signal an impending absence of grip, but you'll be surprised at the enjoyment to be found in cracking on. More relevant to most owners, the Land Rover adventures occur more in the mind than off-road, and a new touchscreen interface, new digital or parked digital instruments, and significantly more cabins storage space, while the slotting mid-row is now split 40-20-40. The redesigned seats include an optional massage facility up front, and there's the optional third-row seating, which is unusual for this class. So the massage is up front. Does the back row give the mani pedis? <laughs> I I think that would be a, a special uh, option. Only on the autobiography. <laughs> Maybe it's the autobiography. It's the massage edition, Harold. The massage okay. edition. The the spa edition. What I read in this was like you're completely disconnected from the driving experience. Yeah. Like really, really. Yeah, I got that too. Ah. <sighs> Like, uh, welcome to modern technology. Yeah, I guess so. But then, welcome to modern technology, or welcome to 1960s America, losing true, all too. your road feel and probably both. It's, I think it's the commoditization of vehicles. You know, certainly a bigger conversation. But as you commoditize the vehicles, and they're just becoming a, a, a literally a vehicle, and you and people are going to be using Uber or some sort of taxi service, and it looks the way that things are going. Only specialized vehicles will be available for people that want to buy them. I don't know. I, I, so I don't like seeing that, like Land Rover going in that direction where you're not feeling the road or you're not in touch with the road. Well, well no, because and like you say, you're commoditizing the vehicle. And then, you know, if you're going to have it, it should be something that is for the enjoyment of the driving. And if you're, if you're not going to want to enjoy the driving, just don't buy a Land Rover, go get a Toyota. Right. And especially, and then on the off-roading side, you're saying that these are capable vehicles off-road, Great, wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. What does that mean if I'm going? If you're saying that on road, you are removing the driving experience, or at least what I think the driving experience is from from the normal driving on road driving, does that translate to off road driving? And if it if it doesn't, I think they need to call that out and state that. Yeah. So a little update on diesel vehicles in the U.S. I think that's only this is from Kelly Blue Book, and this again only applies, I believe, to the U.S. I don't think it applies to Canada. It will be harder to find a 2020 car or sport utility with a diesel engine. Nine models have given up on the engine, but that doesn't mean such that every automaker will follow the same road. In fact, diesels have certain appeal in the truck segment, where the technology's greater fuel economy and torque make them suitable alternatives for carrying heavy loads and towing big trailers. Michael Krebs, an executive of analyst at Cox Automotive says diesels are not going away, but they are largely gone in cars. Diesels are now focused on pickup trucks, a very specific application. It's pretty much all due to Volkswagen and Dieselgate. In addition to all but vanishing in cars like the Chevy Cruze and the Jaguar XE and XF sedans, which went to production last year, Diesel options are on some crossovers and SUVs have also disappeared, including the Chevy Equinox, the GMC Terrain, the Jaguar F-Pace, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, and the Range Rover Velar. They have a list here of the different manufacturers in North America, or, well, I guess the U.S. specifically here, and the ones that have diesels available. Most of them are, again, are trucks. I will skip ahead to Land Rover because that's uh, relevant to our interests, of course. A Land Rover offers three diesel models for the 2020 model year, and Range Rover has four. <laughs> I like how they split them out. Yes. Instead of just saying Land Rover has seven, each turbocharged 3-liter V6 is rated at 254 horsepower, 443 pound-feet of torque, and mated to an 8-speed automatic transmission. Maximum towing capacity is rated at 7,716 pounds. The automaker does not provide a maximum payload capacity. A diesel engine is no longer available on the Velar. The ones that are available, the 2020 Discovery, uh, they have a TD6. Prices uh, start at $53,000 all the way up to $70,000, depending on the luxury of the model. Model level. The top one is the HXE Lux. I've not seen the HXE Lux before. There you go. Maybe that's the massage one, Harold, the Lux. The estimated fuel economy for all three models is identical. 21 miles per gallon city, 26 highway, and 23 combined. Also, the 2020 Range Rover Sport and the 2020 
OG Range Rover. I guess we should start calling it the OG Range Rover. So you can get those. Those are all TD6s available throughout the range. Land Rovers continue. Most of the vehicles are going to have diesels in them. The car that we're not talking about is not supposed to have one, or the truck that we don't talk about is not supposed to have one when it comes out here in, in America. Right, that's ominous. Yeah, which is yeah. What's that? Does that mean down the road they're going to get rid of it for all of the other the other all the other models? Kind of sounds that like they're headed that direction. Otherwise, why wouldn't they put one in in yeah the truck that shall remain nameless? Uh, Atlantic British. The largest independent retailer of Land Rover parts and accessories marks its 50th anniversary this year, and it is expanding its line of overlanding products. There, one that kind of I thought stood out was the Atlantic British exclusive Air 2 coil suspension conversion kit for Land Rovers, from $400 up to $1,300. <laughs> were they at uh, Overland Expo? They were there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm still struggling with, with how they call themselves the largest independent retailer. It's like largest where? We are of Land Rover parts and so on and accessories. in the United States and Canada. Bigger yeah. than, than some of the others? Um, I believe they are, yes. Huh. Okay. All right. And I think they're available on both coasts, right? Because you can get... Yes. True. They did buy out uh, BritPak a number of years ago. And from the UK, everything I'm about to read to you is the entire story. Two front doors stolen off a Land Rover from Main Road in Dunsby. Front doors of a Land Rover were stolen in Dunsby on Monday, October 21st. Lincolnshire police received a report of a disturbance in Main Road between 10.30 p.m. and 10.45 p.m. And when the caller went outside, the front two doors off of the off-road vehicle were missing. Anyone with information should call police on 101 and quote reference number 435 of October 21st. I'm amazed it took someone apparently 15 minutes to take a pair of doors off of a Land Rover, especially if a Series or Defender, would a task that should have taken them probably more like 15 seconds. <laughs> I just wonder if maybe it was they were actually locked and so they had to pick the lock to get the back half of the door loose. Because, yeah, the front front half, all you do is roll up next to it with an impact gun and buzz out four bolts and take hinge and door right off the, <laughs> the bulkhead. I mean, it, it literally just comes off in, in under a minute. So is it like going into the pit at a, at a race car? You can just go in and they're well, off? Yes, except that NASCAR guys have five bolts per wheel to contend with. With a door, you only have four. <laughs> Well, I, I hope this individual gets their doors back. We're not making fun of it, but I just thought it was interesting. The headline just it was. I, I'm kind of surprised they didn't take anything else. I mean, those, yeah. you can you can pick one of those defenders clean in a hurry. Maybe they were they maybe they were stressed about the doors taking too long because I mean the, you know you pop the hood up and you know the bonnet I should say and that just lifts out. That takes no tools whatsoever. And not that I'm giving a tutorial on how to strip a defender for 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 criminal profit, but it's just it's very easy to do very quickly. So usually when they get stripped. A whole bunch of stuff disappears. Kind of weird to see only doors go. Yeah, it's open source information, Harold. That's not. Well, not, I know that, but yeah. I'm, I don't want to promote. No. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting because normally, like I said, they, when they get stripped, they get really stripped. Owning a Land Rover from the Camel Trophy is a special privilege. Petrolicious did an interview with Spanish motorsport journalist Jose Maria Rubio. And he was lucky enough to acquire a Discovery that participated in the 1991 event in Guyana. And he, he immediately set out on a full mechanical restoration to get it running like new. What he didn't do, however, was restore the cosmetics. He left all of the body panels as they were when the truck finished the event. The end result is a Discovery that can still go anywhere and wears its history like a badge of honor. Oh, yeah. You, you wouldn't want to fix that stuff up because then you ruin the entire value of the vehicle. And the interview is all in Spanish, but I... It was like about seven minutes, and I still had it on the background. It was kind of nice to see, so go check that out. And finally in the news, I watched this while I was getting ready for today's show. It's one and a half hours, how I restored a classic Range Rover and saved it from the junkyard. And this is a mostly stop-motion video. Our uh, listener in Barbados sent us on to me, and I also saw it in other places, but it's cool. It's fascinating to watch uh, the this Range Rover classic get stripped down and rebuilt. It's really cool. It's neat to watch. It's not all stop motion. It's mostly stop motion. There is uh, He 
there's some video during it and he introduces the, the whole video, but I recommend you go check it out. Just, you can put on in the background and do some other things and look up periodically. And if you're like me, you'll, you'll be in the middle of doing something and you'll look up and get fascinated with it. And the next thing you know, five minutes has gone by and you're like, oh, I got to get back to what I was doing. I'm curious to go to the, uh, the site, go click on the link that you've got there to take a look at it because I'm fascinated to see how much rust was in this. Thing. A lot, a lot, a lot. There was a lot of rust. <laughs> and that's one of those things that if you have to ask. <laughs> and it's and the way he did the video is it's again it's fascinating. It's cool to watch. You'll see he'll cut out he'll expose the rust, cut out the rust and then weld back on uh, or, or sketch in a new piece of metal, weld in the metal, clean the metal up. It's it's fascinating. It's I think I've actually seen this video. That sounds that sounds really familiar. Came out uh, looks like he was posted August 27th of 2019 from Soup Classic Motoring. Again, we'll have a, of course, we'll have a link to it in the show notes, but yeah, go check it out. Sounds like it could be amusing because when the chap that does the blogging for Atlantic British, Greg Fitzgerald, took apart his Range Rover, it was just fascinating the places that there was rust holes that you just would never realize that water would get there in the first place. It'll be interesting. I go back to fascinating. Yes, whatever word you want to use, it, it's in, it's also, I guess, enticing. It's just, it's it's mesmerizing. There we go, mesmerizing. That's a good word. It's mesmerizing to watch. It's so well, and so well done. Such yeah. a so well for done me, video. it's more like flashbacks but okay you have to remember i have very little experience with plushies <laughs> i was well, scarred by by the, the freelander incidents i will tell you that the you know freelanders are on, the only thing they're well suited for is catching falling chimneys <laughs> it has been reported there is one of there is one for sale in california we have a listener who sent me a picture uh, this week uh, it's in California. It's for sale. We do not know if it's running or not. So this, if it is, this would be, I believe, number eight. We need to get track down that Freelander North America guy and uh, get him on the case. Ah, uh, Mr. Uh, Caldwell out in Montana, world, the Western Hemisphere area Freelander Free. enthusiast or WAIF, WAIF. club for uh, Freelanders. All right, I'm tasking you, uh, Dixon, to reach out to him. We need to get him on the we show. Need, we need contact info. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll find some for you. That's the news for October 2019. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic cars and trucks from Europe and South America. They're a registered Virginia dealership with a physical showroom just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. They specialize in importing and restoring different makes, models, and variants of vehicles not originally sold in the United States. Their vehicles are imported, titled, and available for you to test drive before you buy. For the Land Rover enthusiast, looking for two-door Range Rover Classic, TDI-powered Discoveries, or beautifully restored Defenders, their showroom in Marshall, Virginia is a unique destination. Looking for something special? They can help source, restore, and import the special truck you've been looking for or a car. I think they'll do cars also. Contact Commonwealth Classics for your next classic vehicle. Commonwealth Classics. Visit www.cwclassics.com. We need to go down, Harold. Take a visit. I should have done that on the way to the expo. Indeed, you should. we should have. That would have been a good idea. And now on this Understeer podcast, live from Ontario, is Tyler and Jessica Montague Marsh from Ontario. Did I get that right? Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, that's us. So you are 54countrieslater.com. You have a whole website because you're a Canadian family and have traveled a good part of the planet, I think, in a, in a Defender. Is that correct? That's correct. That's well, us. How did it start? It sounds really cool. Thank you. So in Canada, we have a mat leave. You can choose when you have a baby to have a year off or 18 months at a reduced pay. And Tyler is already a stay-at-home dad. So when I also had time off, we decided to use our maternity leave with two kids to do some traveling because it's not often that you're both available for that kind of stretch of time. So we decided to do a 19-country road trip through Europe with our 10-week-old and 2-year-old at the time. And uh, <laughs> Tyler will say he has always wanted a Defender, and he has 
proof of pictures. He like has a scrapbook <laughs> to prove his point to me. And I kind of rolled my eyes saying, oh, it's just a car. Who cares? You already have a car. You drive to daycare once a week. <laughs> you don't need another car. Horribly then- uninformed you are. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I know. Now I'm a convert. But, uh, <laughs> so we started looking at rental cars and they wanted $12,000 for a rental car for our trip. And I said, well, looks like it's your time to shine. And uh, Sneaky Tyler already had all the contacts on his phone. Insurance was already set up. So we acted fast and bought a Defender. It was his dream car. And then we shipped it back to Canada when we were done. Yeah, he tells me Tyler was a Boy Scout because he was prepared for that one. <laughs> yeah, he was. He did his homework. Yeah, but me you, just straight in the irons hot, I guess. But you skipped, Good man. A, you skipped an important part there. You were living in Canada. You purchased a Defender that was in the UK, a site on scene correct yeah so um dixon sight, might be sight unseen is the best way to do it I, i've done it <laughs> by the way i've done that twice so is that right <laughs> so we had a little bit of some warm confidence so there was there's a couple that has set up shop in kind of central ontario that are uh that were british so they had a garage in the cotswolds and a couple of years ago, they moved over to Canada and they set up shop here as Land Rover specialists. So I had been in contact with them in the past and they mentioned, hey, this is the guy that we sold our shop to in the UK. You know, that's a pretty safe bet. So at that point, I started hunting around on Gumtree and Auto Trader and looking for stuff that was in driving distance of that shop. So they, we paid them to do an inspection. The first two, their advice was run like crazy. These are <laughs> not for you. Yeah. And then the third one, Gertrude, the silver 2003 Defender 110, that ended up being, I think, only 20 miles from the shop. So they just they had a mechanic on their lunch break, drive out and see it, give us a full report. We explained that we wanted it, you know, in tip top shape because we were going to do these 19 countries, not all of which were fully developed. We're going to go into Bosnia and Kosovo and uh, Macedonia. So we you know, we don't want to be on the side of the road. I have to tell you at this point that I'm a Macedonian, Bulgarian American. Yes. Yeah, somebody's somebody's little bell started going ding, ding, it's ding, ding, ding. So beautiful. Have you been back? I have. I was there in 2005 with a cousin of mine. We visited uh, Varna, Plovdiv, and also went into Macedonia, Varna, where I saw defenders in Varna from the UN. <sighs> And uh, yes. uh, Lake Lake Okrid, excuse me, uh, Lake Okrid. Yes. So that and my grandfather's from Macedonia, probably around Lake Okrid. And my grandmother, uh, we believe, is from Sofia, Bulgaria. Fabulous. Oh, it's yeah. so beautiful there. Yes. And uh, not many travelers go there. So it's that's our kind of that's our shtick. Yes. Yes. We and like that. I can see why this is a little, I realize off topic, but I can see why they moved to Western Pennsylvania, because it reminds me uh Bulgaria in particular reminded me of Western Pennsylvania, low rolling hills, green. Yeah. Green is for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We had them service the truck, get it completely ready for us. And then they just dropped it at Heathrow airport and we (laughs) loaded up the kids. And so you fly in with, with two kids (laughs) uh, ages, ages, Tom was 10 weeks and Henry had just turned two. 10 weeks. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, we still had that. It was either an adrenaline rush or I don't know, unnecessary confidence. And uh, you know, it's funny because you tell that story and you know, having bought sight unseen people say you're just wiring money to someone hoping they deliver and we go <laughs> yes yeah. exactly you're right that's exactly <laughs> it yeah. Yeah. sight unseen and sight unseen expecting to just get in and drive are two entirely different <laughs> things so exactly. you guys get points for that maneuver <laughs> thank you yeah so so that's like just booking a rental car but you own it yeah, yeah. you just 15. show up and get in <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> but you know i mean from a family perspective we always joke you know no offense to all the family van listeners, but it's not a cool ride. Like people kind of roll their eyes. Oh, we've got to get a van. We have kids. And, but the storage, no, you, space, don't. you do not. We have a 110, and like that thing eats luggage for breakfast. It's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. So you fly to Heathrow, you mm-hmm. have a 10 week old and a two year old. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, I assume it was left hand drive. It is a right hand drive. It's a right hand uh, drive. Being English, yeah, because we got it out of the Cotswolds. So right. it. Um, it was sitting at the hotel. The hotel staff was very anxious to see who these owners are of this defender. <laughs> that was just sitting, um, on the, sitting on the car lot there and no one knew why. That's yeah. right. Who the heck parked this junk in our lot? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And so we've got this big double stroller. Both boys are strapped in. We've got our luggage. We go to front desk and ask for the keys. We stayed one night at the hotel. Smart. Got up in the morning and we set off for Tesco. And uh, we'd been in Europe before, and and I know that you can get diapers everywhere and that sort of thing, but not really economically. Right. So we bought, you know, three months worth of diapers, three months worth of formula, three months worth of clean water. We just wanted to be self sufficient, and that load area, you know, it didn't even put a dent in it. And uh, so we loaded everything into it, and then that's. It, I had not driven a Defender before. I had, had not shifted with my other hand before. I hadn't done any of it before, and we just pulled out and started driving. Yeah, it takes 10 minutes. It's not that big deal. Yeah, yeah. and you then that's it true. It, yeah. it, was, it, was, uh, it was something that I had been anxious about leading up to the trip, and it was, uh, it was zero problem. Right. As, as long as you know how to drive a manual transmission, the, the, the changeover is not a big deal. No, it wasn't at all. You're right. Folks ask me because I have uh, yeah right hand mm-hmm. drive here in the U S. People say yeah, two tough? of them, two of them, and it is oh, that, both. Is, is that tough to drive? I'm like, no, it's easy. It's not that difficult. The problem is, is when you go to the U K. and you make a turn because here in the U S. and you make a turn, you stay to the right. There, you have to stay to the left, and I have to actively think about that. You know, yeah. Yeah. that to me is the that's the biggest problem is when you go to the other country and you're making a turn. That that is the, yeah. Everything else oh, yeah. is pretty much is, is the same, really. Yeah, yeah, it great. is. So, Jessica, did you drive also? I didn't. Tyler, <laughs> Tyler doesn't have a forte of navigating. So <laughs> he'll give a direction, you know, in eight kilometers, turn right, and that's it. I just have to estimate eight kilometers. So we <laughs> we stick to our yeah. strengths. <laughs> <laughs> but at least, at least being a Canadian, you know what a kilometer is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. The evil yeah. metric system. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it was just an excuse by Tyler to get more seat time. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, might, it might have been. Do you remember the first time driving yours? The road noise difference that surprised us. Oh, Coming I've from... driven a bunch of stuff, so no. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the first time, the I mean, my very first uh, Land Rover was a Freelander, but then the uh, after that, I uh, picked up the uh, Series Three. So. Then I went. So, in other words, your very first Land Rover was a Series Three. No, 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 no. no. And so, road noise in a Series Three with a canvas top, um, it's all road noise. And a blown transmission. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, what about the truck? Did, uh, did met expectations and, and was there something that didn't? So I, I assume your uh, garage took care of you, but you know, did something go wrong or was or was everything okay? Um, for the for the most part, everything was okay. Um, so we headed, we loaded up and headed right for Dover. We took the ferry over to France. We did France, Belgium. We kind of set up shop in Switzerland for four or five days over Easter and just let everybody acclimatize to the time change. Then we carried on into Italy, uh, keeping it kid centric. We went to Peppa Pig world in Italy. It had just opened up. Uh, that was a blast. And then we set up shop for quite a while in Tuscany. It's very kid friendly and they could wander around. Uh, and it was wonderful. So we had the exhaust rust through and, and break basically in Tuscany. Oh, and we were staying in this very small village. There was one, uh, one guy in the village that spoke English. He owned the pizzeria. And, uh, so it broke and, and I walked into the pizzeria and said, Francesco, do you know anyone that has a Land Rover? And he said, yes, you guys. 
<laughs> I said, okay, 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 do you know anybody else that owns a Land Rover? Uh, ours is broken. He said, yes, I could hear that. <laughs> so um, he said, uh, well, my grandpa's a mechanic. Maybe he could look at it. He spe- The grandpa speaks no English. He happens to be in the pizzeria at the moment. I can hear Francesco saying Land Rover and the grandpa saying, no, I won't touch it. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> And then I said, no, 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 Defender. And as soon as I said Defender, the grandpa said, oh, yeah, that's fine. Tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Um, so, so the grandfather has standards. I like that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and so he put it up on some logs. He lifted it with a forklift. It was all very rudimentary. But uh, that well is still yeah. is still good two years later. <laughs> Of course it is. Wonderful. Yeah, that's yeah. not the first time we've heard those it, things. It must be happen. the olive oil that he added to it. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we had one other experience in Albania, but this is a testament to Defender owners. It's such a tight club. Like once you have one, you're instant friends. Right. So we had, what was it? The power steering went, something happened in Albania and Prior to buying ours, we looked at Drive Albania, which is a tour group that does kind of backcountry camping in that area of Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, using um, Land Rovers, and he had a couple Defenders. So before we bought ours, Tyler was trying to line something up there. And we remembered, hey, this guy Ed from Drive Albania, we should call him, see if he can help us. And it was a Sunday morning at 8 in the morning. And by 10 a.m., he was at our hotel with a flatbed truck to take hours away to his mechanic. And he dropped off a discovery for us. Wow. Well, it got fixed. So it was just this, like, everybody helps each other. It's so nice. So, I mean, that's a low point because you have two kids in the background. <laughs> if you were two adults, you'd just kind of roll with the punches and it's fine. Um but everything just always worked out for us through the community of having a defender. We were on the Italian side still, and I could tell that something was wrong, but I didn't really know. And we kind of limped onto the ferry, very rough crossing across the med. And now we're in Albania and something's clearly wrong with the truck and we don't know what to do. And uh, his name's Ed Reeves with uh, Drive Albania. And it honestly was, yeah, a Sunday morning, a phone call, and we had booked all of our accommodation firm because you get like a 10 or a 15% discount and over three or four months, that really adds up. So had he not bailed us out, we would have had nowhere to stay and we would have lost all of those and we would have you know, had to catch up to our own itinerary. So for him to just put us in his own disco and just keep going was amazing. And as much of a defender enthusiast as I was, it's kind of nice for four or five days to be in a disco <laughs> and uh, it was a little comfier and it was fun and it was automatic and, and, and it spoiled us a little bit. And then we finished the loop and came back around and Gertrude was healthy again. And there's just such a sense of trust. So Ed is a British expat and there was just such a sense of this is my mechanic. I go to him with all my Land Rovers, you know, you can trust him. It's going to be fixed, right? It's going to stay fixed, that sort of thing. And so that was amazing. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask if uh, you, you got a little sentimental for the disco because uh, it was a little more comfier. Did you, uh, <laughs> did you, did, did you think about uh, sticking with a discovery? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. But it, but it is, but it isn't. But it is. But yeah. yeah. So you got the 19 countries. Was this all in Europe or did you, did you move on you know, to bits of Asia or Africa? No, the furthest south we got would have been Macedonia. So we did Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, Albania, Bosnia, but then we worked our way back up. Did you get yeah, the Bulgaria we, too, did you not? Uh, we have done that in a previous trip. Oh, okay, because <laughs> I saw the yeah, picture. Okay. So we, yeah, yeah. So, um, no, that was all within Europe. And then we finished, uh, we dropped the truck in Germany, actually, and then... Um, and then went up to Norway for for the end. But uh, the truck had been left at the port by that point. Oh, uh, should we ask why you didn't take it into Norway? Seems like that would be uh, a cool place to drive. 
Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. It's gorgeous. Is have it, you been there? I have not. I've seen, we, we actually have a friend of the show, uh, yeah. has been to Norway, drove his defender up to Norway. And some of those roads are just absolutely uh, amazing. And the scenery. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We had, I don't have many bucket list places, but I wanted to go to Svalbard, which is the most northerly settlement in the world. And to get there, it's either a flight or a, a boat. So we took a, a ship up there. So they have uh, the seed vault there. Have you heard of this? They have a seed yes. of everything. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that for me was a real highlight, but oh my gosh, if we could go back to Norway kind of camping through it, that would be amazing. Well, yeah. you, you need a picture of your defender next to the big sign saying this is the Arctic circle. Absolutely. Yes. We do. Yes. Yeah. Germany. And then you left it there or, or, and then flew back home. Yeah. So we left it in Germany and we were told that everything was fine at the port. Um, that uh -oh. it would be shipped, yeah. <laughs> that it was going to be shipped to Montreal and that maybe we would even want to mail the ownership home because it's, it's going to go so quickly that it might even beat you there. That was in June. And I think it got to Montreal in October. Oh, wow. oh my. So yeah. It was such a, so after we left the vehicle and they said everything was okay, someone went, wait a second, this is a UK registered vehicle owned by a Canadian couple that's no longer here, left in Germany. It, I think it raised a lot of red flags sure. and there's not a lot of transparency in the shipping industry. Uh, it was the first time we had done it. So, I mean, there was a lot, it was a steep learning curve. So the vehicle was registered in your name, but I assume from the UK, so that probably caused, so that probably raised the flags there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Part of the reason uh, for pursuing the sale in Europe, or sorry, in uh, England, was just that we understood it. We understood how to get insurance. We understood all the mechanics. The shop that, uh, they're called Bespoke Off-Road, and uh, the owner there is Ross, and he was kind enough to let us use the shop address because we needed a UK address. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was very simple as far as registering our, in our own name, having all the paperwork, being confident that we could cross any border and no one would be confused as to whether or not this was our truck. So Plus they do it in English, which makes it a lot easier to do yeah. oh, for your first time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you think the queen would have helped you out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> one would think. Your subjects, your, your subjects after all, you know. That's right. <laughs> so you shipped both of yours from England too? Yes, but the, they went to they went on a row row boat, which is roll on roll off boat. I was yep. going to say yeah. that, and they went to uh, Baltimore, and then okay, yeah, the 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 first one, the one hundred and nine, uh, Harold and I uh, drove down and uh, drove it back. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the statute of limitations is uh, <clears throat> is clear on that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, the second one, the second time it went, it went from, uh, well, the first, the 109, the Series 3 went from Southampton to Baltimore, and then the Defender, uh, which I'm looking at right now, uh, mm -hmm. went from uh, Liverpool because the gentleman that owned it was 10 miles from, from the port, and uh, it went from Liverpool to uh, Baltimore also. And then we got that one oh. uh, shipped, you know, on a flatbed. So for us, the, I guess, biggest takeaway in shipping, and so I want to hear your experience too, <laughs> is that it will be different every time. So we have two now, and the first one... It was just everything that could go wrong did. It cost a boatload to do. Mm -hmm. We just had all kinds of surprises. And then yeah, the, the first one's always expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's like having a baby because then you forget and you do it again. So <laughs> then we bought a second one. <laughs> and it was easy breezy. Everything went as it said it would. Everything, you know, did you have that? Like, it feels like there's no way to budget for shipping it because it depends who you get that day and if they're happy. It helps to use a shipping agent to take yeah. care of some of the, the red tape for you, and that made a big difference. But yeah. also, I had imported mine uh, prior to John getting his, and so John could piggyback on some of my experience. I had somewhat of a bad experience with mine just because it was very time-consuming, and I went down there to get it, and some of the paperwork was not in order, so I had to go home empty-handed and then uh -huh. come back again. And, and so, yeah, that, that, that was a learning experience. Yeah, How long was that drive in between um, having to come back? 
three and a half hours each way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That sucks. <laughs> yeah. And, and because Harold had gone, had done this already, it did make uh, my experience, I think, better. Didn't have any real shipping problems uh, on either truck. The, the biggest one, I suspect, was uh, didn't have any problems when we went to pick it up off the dock because Harold had gone through that experience. That went pretty, pretty well. But when the Defender came in, it turns out the battery had run, had run out and it had a flat tire. So they had picked it up off the ship. It couldn't move. And so they picked it up off the ship and just set it off on the side on the dock. And then so that with a crane, with a crane. <laughs> and yeah, it finally found a shipping company to uh, like a local uh, regional kind of shipper flatbed and finally found someone to handle that and they had trouble finding it because no one knew where it was because it didn't just it had been taken off the <laughs> crane but right. thankfully Mbezi, which was his name originally from i think tanzania uh, harold remembers better than uh, i know that was it zimbabwe, zimbabwe. And, his name was, and his name was in tulisi in tulisi thank you and he thankfully new land rover so he knew where the battery was under the seat that's and right he got it you know he jumped it and you know put some air in a tire and boom and it and it showed up in uh in western pennsylvania so that that was the biggest problem was getting that that shipper i think of all of it that actually has gone actually for me i think probably because harold had gone through this uh, had had gone relatively easy and as he said having those shipping agents even though it costs more money it seems to grease the grease the wheels and makes that go a, a lot easier. It helps to get a shipping agent and a customs broker. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So with uh, Gertrude, the silver one, we had chosen a container because we wanted to leave all of our belongings inside of it, just to because we had so much stuff to ship home, and so that created some some headaches. I still don't know what happened in Germany, why I was there for so many months. And we never really got a straight answer, you know, but it's water under the bridge. It's here and it was worth it. And it's amazing. What port um, did it actually leave? Hamburg. Oh, okay. All right. I'm just yeah. Curious. Hamburg to Montreal. And then, um, the Canadian system's a little funny. It gets to Montreal, but it's still not really out of the system. And then it comes down on a train to Toronto and then it's cleared customs in Toronto. And then you can pick it up in Mississauga, which is like a suburb. So um, on a train, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Doesn't that sound like a good kid's book? Have you ever seen those? We have all the Landy series of the children's books. And yeah. how she, she's, they... she's been on the show. Oh, Is Veronica she? LeMond. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's cool. She's actually, yeah. I think, in the middle of writing an American edition of uh, Landy. Oh. Landy comes to America, oh. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, that's maybe fun. that's yeah. my idea right there. L Landy gets seized by CBP. <laughs> that's yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Landy has a fake VIN. <laughs> Um, Landy gets crushed. We got a whole series going. Yeah, exactly. yeah we're spitballing now. L Landy moves to Canada. Yeah. yeah. Landy meets the defender of defenders. That's right. That's a good one. Um, yeah, but then with the green one, uh, we did roll on, roll off as well into Halifax, trucked it from Halifax to Ontario, and it just it couldn't have been any smoother. Well, the uh, Roro is a lot cheaper too, and it's, and it's faster. Yeah, 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 it is. So yeah, you live and learn, and and uh, we we think we figured it out now. We'll see. That, that makes... I think the silver one stayed in Germany so long because it was silver, and they like their silver cars in Germany, and they just absolutely wanted to look at it. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> check the odometer. Maybe people were driving it. Yeah, <laughs> joyriding. There you go, Ferris Bueller's. So tell us yeah. about the tell us about the green one. How did that come about, and what it, what what's its uh, details? Uh, Gertrude, the silver one, is a 2003 110, uh, so the TD5. Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Yeah. right. See, they get the good stuff up there. I do. <laughs> yeah, and, I really... And the, inter the interesting thing is it's UK spec and it has air conditioning. Yes, it does. It does. We Which found makes it very rare. Yeah, and we found looking around that there's no increase in value on the ac so if you're gonna get the rovers north add-on kit or something you're you know five grand and then plus the labor to put it on but that's not it wasn't like gertrude was 5k more than everything else that didn't have it that's because the air conditioning doesn't really work anyway so yeah that's add right <laughs> gertrude has the air conditioning it had central lock which is nice because it's got the fob so you know defenders aren't known for their kind of modern conveniences but that's really nice. <laughs> and uh, had power windows just in the front, obviously. 
when you're on the quote unquote wrong side of the road, power windows is nice for the toll booth or the drive through or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we knew we liked. Um, I really like the, after 2002, they started putting that center console in on the dash. It's just, it's nice. You could put a, you could put a screen in one day if you wanted, or you could put in some more auxiliary buttons. I just, I like everybody has something they like. That's the dash that I like. Well, that can be added, you know. Oh, sure it can. Yeah. With the TDI dash, you can mug UK does a nice unit and it looks, you know, pretty much the same, but, uh, I've I've done a couple of those. Have you? Oh yeah. With two little kids at home, I knew that I wouldn't. So we're just, let's get what we want and then, and then let's drive it. So that was, uh, that was Gertrude. A contact that we had made in England actually reached out to us and they said, you know, my boss has a Range Rover. He's now bought a Defender. He's quickly decided that they are not very similar, and he's willing to part with. Really? Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're they're not the same experience. <laughs> Who knew? So, wow. you know, they had said. Uh, Turns out it's 15 years old. It's another 2003. Uh, would you guys be interested? And that was just kind of it. And we took it from there. And he was a really nice gentleman and uh, worked out well. Again, it was that warm contact. So it seemed like as safe as can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he dropped it at the port for us. And, and now it's here. Nice. And that's a TDI or TD5 also? Yeah, that's right. Same year. They both happen to be 2003s. Uh, right-hand drive again because he was near Oxford. Uh, galvanized roof rack. It's got the white top in the Epsom green metallic. So it's a different look than the silver one, but it's really, really nice. So that's your truck. They both are family. Yeah, <laughs> really. You, you haven't you haven't chosen your your dedicated rides yet. We'll never part with Gertrude. That's our first uh, the silver one. one. I figured that was hers. And then, and then his would be the second one. Yeah. yeah. That's usually how it works. I don't know. We're so sentimental. And so people, we wondered, is it fanfare? People saying, oh, if you ever sell, let us know. How many people mean that, you know, or, but we just could never part with it. So it depends on how often they say it and, and, and how, and, and how inappropriate the time is that they say it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. right. <laughs> yeah. So we thought, well, it doesn't hurt to have a buffer one because it's nice to see them on the road. It's, there aren't many around where we live we have to drive about three hours to one of two shops near us that will work on them so they're kind of rare and so we thought well this one kind of fell into our ownership and so we'll take it and if someone comes along and they feel like the right fit we're happy to part with the second one but in the meantime they are just so different like how how do you choose one as a roof rack one as a snorkel i like the epsom green paint but yeah anything can be painted but (laughs) i think we're just sentimental from the silver one yeah for sure are they your daily drivers or do you have another non uh, daily driver no we're we are the we are the oddballs that use them as our daily drivers we don't have a backup mm. good for in you. with both feet you are yeah, yeah fully and you know what we good for uh, you uh, i'm of course, my, mind you 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 work from home as a stay-at-home dad so you know yeah. with with two of them the chances are pretty good that she'll be able to get to work in one of them yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's right. So I don't know. Where are you located? I'm sorry. We're near, where Pit- am- near Pittsburgh. Okay. So our winters, you would have cold winters too. And we learned, we went winter camping in January. And that was the first time we learned about having to put in... Um, uh, fuel conditioner in the diesel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was our lesson learned for winter driving. But <laughs> <laughs> now that we know that you can start them easily for $8 yeah. solution, we carry some with us in the winter. You only need to let your diesel freeze once before you learn that you don't want to do that again. Yes, I had that happen to me uh, last year when I, after I went, <laughs> went to the main winter romp and I went up to visit my friends in Quebec and the yeah. uh, yeah. car sat, the, the truck sat for, they say two days, didn't use it and got up to in the morning to use it and it wouldn't turn over because yeah. it was down to that, like, That's why all the cars and trucks in my native Minnesota had that little wire sticking out the front of the grill. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and the electric outlets in all the parking spots. Yeah, yeah so you right. knew this already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the glow plugs weren't good enough to uh, to 
warm up the defense. No, they just didn't do the job that morning. Yeah, they, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> Two defenders. Uh, what other journeys uh, do you take in them? You've done this uh, one that you did in in Europe. And when when did you take that trip? How long ago was that? That was a year ago. Those that was a year ago, ago pretty yeah. much right now. Yep. Okay. Okay. And you were there for how long? Uh, we did four months. Nice. Nice. And and that was a combination of camping and hotels or were you? Uh... Yeah. A lot of Airbnbs. We did some camping. We did some hotels. We tended, we thought that the drive days might be stressful, but the drive days ended up being some of the most peaceful days on the trip. So Tom, who was only 10 weeks old, the defender was like a sleep machine. Like as soon as you put him in it, he's just asleep <laughs> the whole time. White noise. And uh, the, and Henry, the, the rumble was of just the TD five. That's right. <laughs> Henry who needs was, who needs cribs. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Henry was just at this perfect age where I had loaded two hundred episodes of Peppa Pig onto an iPad, <laughs> and they played endlessly on a loop. And that was just it. So we would put in these huge drive days, eight or 10 hours, and then we'd kind of set up somewhere for a week and we'd just explore and really take it easy and let the kids be kids. And then we'd do another big drive day. I felt like loading up that Defender and driving for two hours was the same as loading it up and driving for eight. So why don't you do the eight and, you know, cut the drive days almost in a quarter. The, the loading and the unloading is as much work as the driving. Oh, for sure it is. And we found too, like we bought a Defender because I really wanted one and I'm spoiled and I begged <laughs> long enough that Jessica did it. So All very good reasons. As, yeah. <laughs> as far as I could tell you a bunch of other stuff about why it was right, but like that was, that was why we did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then when you get to Tesco and you buy 900 diapers and you stick them in it and there's still room, you go, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, then we crossed into France and we passed a guy in a 90 and he honked and he waved. And Jessica said, why did he do that? Oh. And I said, I said, oh, it's the Defender wave. You don't know about the Defender wave? <laughs> Part well, of Welcome to the community. That's, that's right. right. And so one of the kind of highlights for me was all my spare moments I'm on uh, the internet and I'm looking at Land Rovers and old series and Defenders and I'm I'm all in on it. We and call Jessica, that looking at porn. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Jessica's just kind of like, well, this is the car that we're using for the trip. So it was such a pleasure for <laughs> her. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It was such a pleasure for me to see her kind of get it and and get really attached to it and and love it for its quirks and yeah we love we love the wave and we you know we got turned around in Liechtenstein at one point and I just went to a guy's driveway because he had a defender and he knew I did and he was crazy helpful like it's just such a a helpful community indeed it was it is. so nice well, yeah. and, we, and, and bonus points for saying Lichtenstein. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, also bonus points for being there. There's how many people can say they've been to Lichtenstein and actually, well, driven. Well, yeah, but I mean, you, you, said it in a per, yeah, you said it in a personal anecdote, so that's that's the bonus. <laughs> you just kind of yeah, that's right. right slipped in. it right in there like it's no big deal. I was in Lichtenstein. Yeah, yeah, like it's no big deal. I have a customer who was stationed in Europe, and he lived in Switzerland, but he got his trucks serviced at the dealer in Liechtenstein. And so he, he would throw out these anecdotes about Liechtenstein, and, and just when you go out the Alps, it does this. And it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Such a show-off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing we found is that load area in the back it just worked for everything. So we'd go to the beach and it's the boys change room or, you know, the boys are napping and we could extend our day because we could go anywhere and put them both in the load area and have a nap. So we, I mean, we have a couple great pictures of we're sitting on the, on the rear lip with the door open, looking at the ocean and the kids are sleeping behind us. And just like the defender made that trip. Like it was just, it was a really good choice. Another thing that no one else will have noticed until you've had a toddler in a car seat is that you can see out the window of Defender windows when you're a kid, where most oh. current day cars, the windows are higher up. So if you say, oh, look out the window, there's a horse, your kid can't see it because <laughs> of their height. But in a Defender, there's you sit so high, so then it's it's engaging for everybody. 
Yeah. Yeah. We we call that stadium seating. But that's yeah, right. That's yeah. right. So Jessica, this is the first time we've had a mother on who had very, very, very young children in in a defender. What kind of challenges? I have no idea what you know what questions to ask, but like what challenges were there for you happened or needed to be addressed, or maybe there weren't any. No, there weren't any. And <laughs> I feel I feel like a pusher now, but I feel like why doesn't everybody have this? Well, I, I can't imagine why you'd want to take a trip in anything else. <laughs> I know. The, I don't know if it's the lack of airbags, but <laughs> there's so much space. Ah, the airbags, schmear bags. <laughs> I was able to sit between both car seats in the back seat for a long time. And you can't do that in many cars. Like, it's just... It makes everything feel like an adventure. So even now that we're home, like if we go for a day trip, it just feels like you're on holiday because it's fun and it's rugged and, you know, people want to stop and chat about it. It's just a real, it's a pleasure to own. And Tyler said, <laughs> and it didn't go over well when he said it originally, just think it'll be part of our family one day. <laughs> and I said, it's a car. It's not going to be a member of our family. And now <laughs> I get it. <laughs> It feels like, yeah, it needs its own little pin map on the wall of all the places our defender's gone. It's This is bad, isn't it? I sound like a, a crazy person, but we just love it so much. You, you, <laughs> if you're a crazy person, you sound like every other listener to the program okay. and us. So. In, and every other guest on the show. Yeah. We're yeah. in good company. Oh, well, yeah, you, sh you should talk to the Bells sometime because their truck, Mafuda, they, I mean, they say in so many places in their books that Mafuda is a member of the family. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. We've noticed, too, like even locally, a friends of ours, you, oh, that's nice, you're a defender, and then they'll come with us somewhere. Maybe we'll drive on a, a date, we'll drive to supper, and they say, we can't believe how many people film you when you drive and take pictures at red lights and want to stop and talk to you. Like They say we get the hype once we're in it with you, but if you don't live through that, you kind of go, oh, what's the big deal, right? But it's it's really fun. <laughs> It's, it's actually, yeah. I think, a very friendly vehicle. It has a friendly yeah. look and feel to it, partly, I think, because of all the glass. And it does sit up high. You can see the person inside. The windows aren't tinted, which is, especially in America, a lot of, lot of heavily, deeply tinted windows, which is illegal in Pennsylvania. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, so that's, uh, yeah, I, I think it makes that kind of a very friendly and accessible vehicle, in addition to the rarity of it also. Yeah, I get, I get people walk all the time, and my annoyance... <laughs> If there is, I'll be driving and then someone will come up behind me and then I'll sit, but they'll sit in the blind spot. I'm like, yeah. I'm like come on. If you, I, okay, I, I don't care if you take a picture. I don't care if you wave. I don't, that's fine. But do it so yeah. I can see you. you know, come up, yeah, come let's up to the window. You know. <laughs> but that's my, that's my, uh, that's my only. Uh, yeah. yeah. Concern really is that they sit there and I'm like, okay, that's fine. Just move on, move on. I, on, I can't yeah. tell you how many cars I've seen, especially if I'm on a, an interstate highway and they will, Come up quickly, slow down, yes. go forward, maybe, sl and they might fall back a little bit and then go forward again. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there I you want to get another look. I guess so. And I'm like, oh. yeah. and, I, and I'm cruising at 62 miles an hour. I'm like, I'm not, yeah. yeah, that's right. I'm not changing my speed. This is what's happening. This is where I'm going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the kid, the kids love the truck. Is it, do they feel it's part of their, their family now too? Any sense of that? Yeah, yeah, so our smallest one, Tom, this is no joke. He could say Gertrude before he could say Mama. Uh, 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 <laughs> the, kid, the kid's got his priorities. Yeah, he knows. He wants to go in the garage and see Gertrude every morning. Yeah. And, and these, these two children are so lucky that they will grow up never having to ride in something else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah Henry. Um, last Christmas, he asked for a, a defend a, the, blue defender, the Bruder defender. Oh yeah, yeah. A little yeah. So uh, we got him the green one. Hey, there you go. Hey, there it is. <laughs> uh, so we got him the green hard top, and then the next year, uh, he asked he wanted a blue one. You know, so we got him the blue one. We got him building his fleet. Books. He is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He is. So we're going. Um, 
in a couple months, we're going to go to the UK to celebrate our anniversary, and we're bringing the kids. And they have an amusement park there called Diggerland, where they have, have you seen the child-sized defenders that you can drive? Right. They're right. like those little, you know, the plastic Jeeps or whatever kids right. have at Christmas. It's a big deal, I guess. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we were doing so there. well, and then you had to drop the J-bomb. <laughs> yeah. I know. Have you ever been driving? and Cut you? That part out <laughs> <laughs> and you see a jeep owner go to wave and then they put their hand back down like we all know to stick to our make <laughs> yeah well, usually yeah. usually they wave and i'll wave back just because it's you know no no hate it's all good actually and a lot of them wave because they, they recognize no that that we are so much cooler than they are yeah i think that's what it is yeah <laughs> they're, they're envious <laughs> i just think i actually i think they don't know any better yeah. yeah. That's, so that's well, uh, hence them owning Jeeps. <laughs> <laughs> this is so mean. But now I'm now I'm in my comfort place. I feel like every time a Jeep waves at us, I go, oh, that's too bad. Because they <laughs> wish they were here. <laughs> but see, Take some pity on them, yes. The, they, they, that's right. But that's actually not as bad as the fact that Range Rover and Discovery owners don't wave back. That, yeah. that one hurts more. That well, hurts more. Yeah. They're too busy holding their nose in the air. Yes. <laughs> yes. But little do little do the discovery people know that they're just future defender parts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's true. Indeed. And I will purposely wave at all Land Rovers. And I know and Harold has said this, and other friends have said this. Like, why? They're not. They don't care. I'm like, I know, but I'm still waving because it's someday someone may recognize it and go, okay, yes. That's fine. Yeah. It is interesting, though, that a lot of Range Rover owners that we pass don't acknowledge it. Like, they, I don't know if they know that it's in the same family. No, they, they probably don't. don't. They don't. No. Yeah. no. I, no. Have, I have friends who are car people, but they're not Land Rover people, and they always will say, how's your Range Rover? Are you bringing your Range Rover? And then I have right. to yeah. exp explanation. In reference to your ex-military Series 3, they're yeah. calling it a Range Rover. <laughs> exactly. So how did Gertrude get its name? That was Henry. Our, yeah. our, uh, he's now three. I don't remember. I don't know. He was two, and we, I don't know. We just asked him what he wanted to name it, and he came up with Gertrude. That's right. And we know better than to argue with a toddler. Yeah. So <laughs> Gertrude it is. Fair it's enough. a sturdy name. And what's the what's your other one called? Does it have a name? Mickey. Yeah, Mickey. And that was Henry too. And there was no rhyme or reason. And it was just we showed him a picture of it when it was still in uh, Southampton at the port. And he said, "Oh, there's Mickey." And so again, yep, that's it. That's Mickey. All right. Well, you know, you're going back to the UK soon. Maybe there's an opportunity for for Henry to come up with another name. Oh. Yeah, there might be. There might be. Do you guys name yours? <sighs> I, it's, I never got into that. I I know every, a lot of people do. It's even in America, they'll name theirs. I just I never really got into that. I think if I'm going to call my 110 anything, I call it Oxford uh, uh -huh. as a as an homage to the Oxford truck. Absolutely. That, you know, for the well, uh, it is Oxford Blue like. after all. And, so yeah, yeah, they end up getting painted blue, which kind of has that looks like Oxford Blue. So that would that'd be the closest I get. I I ha I've had a. Uh, Freelander, Discovery, and the Series 3, and now the 110, and I have never n really named any of them. That's just never a thing I okay. did. Okay. Harold, you? Uh, well, I refer to, well, my Series 3, I call it the meat wagon, but it okay. is a meat wagon. <laughs> it's it's an ex-military ambulance, which, you know, military <laughs> slang, the meat wagon. Okay. Sure. So it's, it's not really a name. It's just what it is. Yeah, that counts. <laughs> that counts. Designation. So they named, so both kids, well, no, I'm sorry, one kid uh, that was the older one, right, Henry? Yeah. Hen yep. The one capable of speech. The one capable of speech. Yeah. <laughs> right. Names, uh, names both of your trucks. Uh, and do, so the kids enjoy it. Uh, do they know anything else? I mean, have they have, have they actually ridden in another vehicle? Yes, they have. Uh, he does not like... Ah! <laughs> he doesn't like his grandma's car, the Prius. That's right. a no-go. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, now the kid gets points because he understands. Yeah. We had a little fight last night, too, that uh, he did not want to go. I can't remember where we were going grocery shopping, and it had to be in the Defender. That's <laughs> right wonderful. On. That is right wonderful. Opinion. So, yeah. so the kid understands the concept of death by Prius. <laughs> yes, he, he does. 
Have you had other mothers contact you? Because you, you have a, a nice blog, and I, I assume there's... We don't get to hear much about, uh, you know, mothers in, in, uh, in, in traveling and overlanding and, and using... Uh, mothers in rovers. Sounds like mothers a new club. In, oh, there's yeah. it. Mothers in rovers. There we go. Yeah, we'll go with that. Maybe. It's been interesting. Like, we have a big following on our Instagram of expats living in Europe, and... It's funny to me because I post about Land Rover self-indulgently, and I know some people probably... Is there a better it. way? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> some people might skip over those posts because it's not of interest to them, but I'm seeing, I'll get emails from women around the world on holiday and they'll send me a picture, you know, saw this in Spain and thought of you, saw this in Portugal. And I do wonder, like... These are moms on holidays with their kids who don't have one. I'm just now associated with the brand in their opinion. And their husbands must be wondering, like, why is my wife taking a keen interest in defenders taking pictures of them? And, you know, they're in And why, why would he want to complain? I mean, come on. <laughs> That's you're, right. you're doing the world a service by showing all these women just how valuable a Land Rover can be to their family. And it really can. I know that uh, we're like, you know, we're all laughing, but it is such a great family car. And we're going camping uh, next week coming up and Henry can't wait to go camping rooftop. Like it's just, it's fun and it's exciting and it adds a bit of spice to your life. Like you can get into a real routine as a family of what your day looks like and it's just been fun for us and i think other like we get comments from women around the world saying oh you're making me want to get one i don't know that anyone will follow through on it but it's nice to see that they see how much true joy it brings us it's just been it's been fun to own well, I, I notice on your 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 blog uh, that you know a lot of the pictures and a lot of the focus is about those lifestyle things that I think women would be drawn to, and I think that's really cool yeah. because I don't think there's a lot of that out there right now. That's true. It is. Um... It is male heavy. We went to, we go every year to the British car show in Oakville, which is near Toronto. And I noticed last year it was hard for men to make a conversation with me too. And I think, oh, I also own one. I am also here with our car. And it, it, the conversation goes to Tyler and that's fine because it is kind of, it's a, it's a niche category and then I think for people our age, it's a little bit more rare, too. You see a lot of kind of men in their 40s, 50s, 60s with one. But it's not necessarily attracting. We are kind of the older part of millennials, and it's a spoiled age group where we want, you know, comforts and ease. And the, some of the inconveniences of your Defender not starting wouldn't fly with a lot of people our age. Well, well <laughs> and the fact that it has... The fact that it has manual transmission already gets rid of most of your your contemporaries. Yeah, that's sure. true. Yeah, millennial anti theft, we call it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> how does this work? I don't understand. Did, did yeah. you know how to drive a stick before Jessica? Before the land, the Defender. I went to yes, I learned to drive stick in right hand drive in Australia. So I was there in my early twenties, and that was kind of the option there you know how some countries are just predominantly stick and so that if you want to drive you had to learn and so that was lucky i've, I've actually never driven manual left-hand drive <laughs> so okay <laughs> that would be my switch yeah <laughs> yeah you'll you'll find yourself throwing your left hand out the window a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you can, you're, you're welcome to come down to pittsburgh i have a uh, Jetta, that is a uh, six-speed. You can you can try that out. That's uh, thank you. Left, that's left-hand drive. Yeah. Although that that is actually it's a modern car, but it is harder to drive this that stick than it is a Defender. Defenders are great to learn. Defenders and series great to learn how to drive stick on. But that Jetta is what happens is that it, if it gets to 799 RPM, yeah. the engine, it shuts the engine shuts off because yeah, the, there's no the lugging. torque Nazi done. says you're done. Right. <laughs> Just done, and so you're you know, done. And in Pittsburgh, a lot of hills, turns, yeah. and you're just you know, you're. And if you don't do it right, it has the turbo, so you got to wait for the turbo to. Spin. Yeah, and and the way it's geared, there's just not a lot of torque until the, till the turbo is spooled. So it's a a fine line between stalling and lighting those front tires up. 
I have <laughs> I have squealed I have squealed the tires in the Jetta. That has happened on more than one occasion. Yeah. I don't I don't I'm not trying. A couple it's of stuff. times, Johnny. They yeah. chirp, they chirp and they, they chirp. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? We have we have a snorkel on our silver one, and Tyler was desperate to use it when we were in Europe, and we just kept saying like, now is not the time because you're gonna feel like a real goon if something goes wrong and we're stuck with two kids because oh, yeah. we wanted to go off roading, right? So I we kept saying wait till we get home and we just haven't yet although there is a um an off-roading course up a couple hours north of us that we keep intending to reach out to the owner of that property because it's on his private property but he has how many defenders i think he i don't know about defenders uh but he has about 30 land rovers yeah uh, that's a good start yeah, yeah, and he's retired, and he's built this course uh, on his property, and he's invited us out. But it's just, you know, it's one of those things with two kids. It's yeah. it's hard to get up there. So I yeah. guess that's how you define a retirement. You amass 30 rovers in your set. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's really retired. He's probably pretty busy. <laughs> that's why we needed to have Dixon on the show, so he he probably knows who that is. Dixon probably oh, yeah. knows that Dixon, guy. Yeah, Dixon know him for sure. Mm -hmm. um, have you? You, got know, you know, the two of you really ought to come down uh, in April and go to Texas for the Scar. Oh, I don't know about that one. What is that? You should, well, uh, listen to the back episodes of the show. But um, <laughs> but Scar, Scar is 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 the South Central Area Rover Rally. But the reason why I say that is because there are a lot of women at that particular event, and it's a very family-oriented event. Oh, that's and in conjunction with the Scar, they also have the Barbara Toy Tribute Run. Oh, really? Which is no dudes allowed. Oh, oh that's cool. Very cool. Well, no, awesome. yeah, guys aren't driving. It's a, it's a all well, women drive. You can have a guy as a as a spotter or for assistance, and um, trying to actually expand that out to other uh, Land Rover events. Uh, but I'm not sure how successful that's been. Yeah, yeah. have you been to uh, Land Rover events in North America? Have you been to the birthday party? Have you been to Mar? No, we are still so. I think just with this age and stage of kids, like we know. We've heard of Dixon and uh, his Ottawa Valley Club. Uh, so we do the British Car Day every year because it's about an hour from our place. Right. Um, Good start. You know, yeah, and we've been invited to some other stuff. We just can't. Uh, we just can't can't sort out getting there. We'd love to do Winter Romp one year. We'd love to do the birthday uh, party. You, you might want to let your children get a little bigger before you do the winter romp. Absolutely. And that's <laughs> the thing. Like if the kids aren't having fun, then we won't be having fun. And then it'll just feel like we've kind of, you know, spoiled it for everyone. So right. but uh, you, you could do some of the Southern events, uh, warm weather. Yeah. Might oh yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, absolutely. Mars in early October. That would, uh, I'd recommend that one. That's a, that's a, okay. it's a hit yeah, or that's, miss. That's, on a, the temperature, that's a good, but. that's a good family event. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have really, you the, done? the big risk there is more precipitation than temperature. Yes. Okay. Sure. And what about Vermont? Have you been there? I've been to Vermont, uh, not for any Land Rover events, though. Um, but yeah, well, there's there's British Invasion, which is a big show. If you're doing right. if you're doing car shows, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think British Invasion always falls on the same weekend as our uh, British Car Day. Because of course it always, does. Yeah, there's always a split of you know who's going to go where and, and who's going to be. Well, you be. have two trucks. Yeah, yeah that's right. Divide that's and right. conquer, maybe. <laughs> You, you told us the story of when you bought Gertrude and 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 that was uh, enabled your your uh, 19 country sweep through Europe uh, but but I notice your website is called uh, 54countrieslater.com uh, how do you get to 54 from 19 yeah, I grew up uh, traveling, and full credit to my parents they were real travel bu bugs and before internet and GPS and everything was kind of easy, they sold everything they had and moved our family onto a sailboat in the Caribbean. And so we spent three and a half years when I was a little girl in the Caribbean. So that got me some countries. <laughs> and then after that, it just kind of was, it's in them, it's in me. They don't do like hold the rope bus tour holidays. I have very adventurous parents and uh, that rubbed off. And I- yeah, Certainly the notion of traveling in your own vehicle. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It makes things easier. 
So we just, I had this, you know, young mentality, I'm going to go to every country in the world. And then we got a house and a career and kids. And so now I'm not as ambitious in ticking through. I don't just want to see every country to say I've been there, but we definitely book trips with the mentality. Hey, if we're in Italy, Albania is not far. (laughs) And that's how we've kind of racked up so many countries that we always are looking, where are we going anyway? What's around there? And let's, why not see, see more of the world? And some have been pleasant surprises and some haven't been as accommodating with kids, but it's, you know, everything has been good. And so we have a couple more countries coming up. We're going to go back to the UK. And then, of course, with that mentality, well, Poland and Latvia and Lithuania aren't very far away. (laughs) The thing is, once you're over there, everything's so close and everything's affordable with little flights. And so you just kind of do what you were going to do anyway with a couple bonus. And so now I'm at 60 countries and our son, Henry, is now three and he's at, I think, 25 and Tom is one and he's at 21 countries. So it's just, and I don't have that in me to go to the same place over and over. So there's, you know, there's so much to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Certainly. One of our early episodes, we had a, a couple on that have, have a truck they call the Lizzie bus and mm-hmm. they, they, uh, well, of course they're, they're older. And I think they, they rented out their house and just decided to take a, a few years. And, and actually it was six, six years, six continents, 66 countries. Wow. wow. And 166,000 miles. So, yeah, it's about the sixes. Wow. So, then, so uh, they got home from that, and they took took Lizzie Bus to a shop, tore it completely down to the frame, rebuilt it, and with the goal of going again. That's amazing. Yeah. So someday you might find yourself in a position to, to have a couple of years to spare, yeah. and, and maybe you can do more. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's nice when you have a chunk of time like that, like for them – uh, renting out their house too. They have somewhere to go back if they need to. There's a backup plan because it can be scary to kind of get out of the real estate market once you already have your house. Right. That's you know everything inflates and that's but it's nice. Good for them. The whole yeah. thing. And I, I don't think I could, I could have the stomach for the, for the risk factor involved in just selling everything and just living in my rover like the bells are doing that's that's a little more than i would want to undertake yeah i find that daunting <laughs> yeah or yeah. you could be like the austrian sandra and bernard they have the same thing they rented out their house and uh, then they started traveling and they ha- of course they have a 2009 defender puma which is really mm-hmm. nice by the way because <laughs> again the- because they can because they can i got the ride in it, it was very exciting and but, uh, yeah. but the nice thing about them coming over here as tourists they can drive that around the states and mm-hmm. then they can bring it out and i can play with it because i don't get to see those sorts of things because right. we're not we're not, a, we're not allowed cool stuff like that you know you guys in canada with the 15 year rule you you get newer stuff than we do. And, and honestly, you know, if I was looking for a good reason to defect out of the U S that would be it. <laughs> that and the health care. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 that, no. The only reason would be that would be hey, health care is good, yeah. but you know, you can get health care a lot of places, but cool land rovers. No, 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 no. That's the reason. Yeah, that's the reason. Right yeah. There. I know we are lucky there. Like it just feels the gap to 25 years. That's a big jump. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It definitely is. So you have a website that has all this information on it, and I think you have an Instagram account. Can you uh, let our listeners know where to find you? Yeah, so 54countrieslater.com. All all spelled out, by the way. Spelt out, and Instagram the same way, spelt out at 54countrieslater. And we're on there. We are are one people separated by a language. I like how you keep saying learnt and spelt, and I'm saying learned (laughs) and spelled. (laughs) (laughs) All right, <laughs> just had to just notice that. So um, I interrupted all that. Yeah, so and, and they spell center the way our, uh, uh, we do. And yeah, you guys are spelling Most center, Americans right? don't, but, but you and I spell center the way they do. And an Instagram is what again, Jessica? At 54 countries later. Oh, same thing. <laughs> same thing, yeah. So you'll find us both of those places. Twitter as well. Um, same handle, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah, he runs that one. Oh, so, great. and that's a mix of lifestyle, travel, and Defender. 
Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you both for coming on the show, talking to us today about your trucks, your travels. Uh, yes, I'm jealous. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And, and give our best to Henry and Tom. And it sounds like you're raising them right. No, and, I was going to say give our best to, to Gertrude and Mickey because those are the kids yeah. that matter. But <laughs> All four of our kids, we will pass along your well wishes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks again. We hope you enjoyed show number 79. That's the Center Steer podcast for this month. I want to thank Tyler and Jessica of 54 Countries Later for being our guests this month. Check them out at 54countrieslater.com. And 54 is spelled out. So it's 54countrieslater.com. Of course, a link in the show notes. I also want to thank Dixon and Harold for coming on the show and joining us today. Thanks, guys. Yep. You're welcome. And visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to the stories we discussed in today's show. We're part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the other 4x4 related shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can directly support the show at www.patreon.com slash centersteer. I also have a link to that from our webpage. And you can also now buy us a tea. So you go out to our website, and there's a link to buy me a tea. You can also show your support for the show with a t-shirt or sticker. Click on store in the menu of our webpage. If you're not a subscriber, please do so. So you can get the show automatically through whatever podcast application you use, whether it's iTunes or Overcast, which I like to use. And you can also rate the podcast and that'll help others to find and discover the show. Is your kid a Land Rover fanatic? We're still looking for kids to talk to. We'd like to talk with them. You can email us at messages at centersteer.com with a subject line Rover Kids and we'll schedule a call. Those again, we're going to do Rover Kids. It will be part of our December show. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. Then you may now resume your important things. A lot, a lot, a lot.